Great, thank you very much. And thanks so much for inviting me. And as said, do you just pitch in if you want to ask a question, pop your hand up and yeah, you're welcome to do that during the talk. So today I'm going to go through a general overview and introduction to the Sutton Trust. So who we are, our research and policy work. I'll go into a bit of detail on three specific areas looking at university access, student finance and access to the workplace. Then I'll give a brief overview of our programmatic work and through all of that, do just ask any questions if you'd like a bit more information. Then I'll go through this report that was mentioned previously, the University of Life, looking at employability and essential life skills at university. And I'll also talk a little bit about a report we did alongside that to look at the impact of coronavirus and the pandemic specifically, because the work for this report was done before the pandemic. So we released it with a kind of update of, OK, what's the situation been since then? So for those of you who aren't familiar with the trust, we are a charity that champions social mobility through research, policy influence and programmes with young people. Now, there's a term that we use internally for this that some people love and some people hate, which is called being a do tank. So it's kind of like being a think tank, but that we also do things and the two sides of the trust interact with each other. So our programmatic work influences our research and policy work. If things that come up with our young people we think would be important to raise to kind of a wider audience, then we will use that to inform the research and policy work. And equally, we use the research and policy work to also inform our programmes. And I'll talk a bit about some examples of that as we go through. So I'm sure this group is aware, but social mobility really briefly is about ensuring the opportunities open to a young person aren't dependent on the economic and social position that they were born into. If you're in a society with high levels of social mobility, that means regardless of your background, you are equally likely to end up in the top or the bottom positions of, in terms of employment in society. But the UK is quite far from that. And for a child born in the UK today, their chances in life are really strongly related actually to their parents' background. Those from high earning families are more likely to end up going to the best in inverted commas universities. I'll talk a bit about that later and getting top jobs later on in life. So at the Trust, we think that if an opportunity exists, it should be equally open to those from low income homes as their wealthier peers. So we focus on looking at this in the world of education and how education policy and employment policy can be changed to try to help with this. Social mobility is much broader and more complicated than that as well and has a lot of impacts from the general circumstances people are being brought up in at home, what access they have to things outside of school. It isn't only what's happening in the school gates, but school is a policy lever that you can pull to try to improve those outcomes for young people, which is why we look at it and that's our focus. But it's important to also acknowledge that that wider context is extremely important. And I think during the pandemic, that wider context when students have had to learn from home and things has been more important and obvious than ever. So we have five key areas that our research and policy work focuses on and we go all the way through the life course. So we start in the early years through to schools, higher education, apprenticeships and access to the workplace. So we do research and policy work in all of those areas. If you have a look on our website, we've got little drop downs for each of those areas to explain our key policy kind of asks in it. I'm going to focus today just looking at higher education and access to the workplace. But if you're interested, you can find all of that for our other areas online as well. Now, because we're a think tank esque organisation, the research and policy work that we do is always uh, adjusted to try to be of interest to people who are in positions of power to make change and to try to get media hits as well so that we can try to get that information out to the widest audience possible. So I've put some examples here of media coverage that we've had um, most of it in the last year, but some of it is slightly older. So we did a lot of work throughout the pandemic looking at the impact that that was having on the poorest young people. So, for instance, we did work looking at nurseries and looking at them broken down by the deprivation level of the area and found that those in the poorest areas said in terms of the view of the providers that they're at most risk of closing because of the pandemic and the economic impact that having children out of the setting was having on them. We've also done a lot of work looking at what school has been like for kids whilst they 
have had to learn from home and how that has differed really substantially by the social economic background of those children. So poorer kids were much more likely not to have the resources they needed, not to have a laptop, the internet, a quiet space to work in. And that's something we're really concerned about going forward, which will also have impacts on higher education in the next few years as those kids come into higher education after potentially the attainment gap between them and their better off peers has widened because of the pandemic. So that's something that will be really important in HE in the next few years. We also looked at what it was like for university students. So the headline here is half of university students think COVID-19 has hit their chances of finding a job. I'm going to cover that research a bit later on in the presentation, so I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. And then the final one here is from a report we did a couple of years ago that was one of our kind of flagship reports where we looked across the top jobs in British society. So those with kind of the most power and influence to change things for other people and looked at what proportion of them, of the people in those roles had themselves been to private school. So private school is a proxy for social economic background in that everyone will know that sometimes you get people who've done scholarships, who perhaps were themselves from lower social economic backgrounds and then have gone to private school and been very successful. But in the main, most of the young people who go to private schools in the UK today are from higher social economic backgrounds. The number of kind of full bursaries or bursaries of at least half the fees are actually quite low. So it does work quite well as a proxy for absolute kind of high levels of, of advantage in society, which is why we looked at it. And as said, most of the people in those kind of top jobs have themselves come from private schools. It is very much that that group of people play a really overly large role in British life. So I thought I'd start uh, by going through some of the kind of policy areas that I thought might be of interest to this group and the major views that the Trust has on those areas. So starting off with university access, one of the major asks that we have in this space is suggesting that universities make greater use, or if they're not already doing it, make use at all, of contextual admissions. So whereby when universities are choosing whether or not to admit a student, they look at what grades they are predicted to get or they have got in the context of their background. Because we know from all our other research that people with a lot of potential and talent don't have the chance through the school system to fully show it because of their social economic background. Whereas quite often those young people do have a lot of potential that could be realised at university, especially with the right help and support. And we've spoken to lots of universities who do this already and have gradually lowered the grades over time. And with that right help and support in place, have had those students with lower grades actually succeed quite well at the university. And that's something we're looking to do a piece of research on in the next year or so. So hopefully we'll have a little bit more information about that and what universities have found so far as well. We also had a report out just last week looking at how you how you actually measure who is from a disadvantaged background to decide who should benefit from these sorts of offers. So that was called Measuring Disadvantage. It's up on our website if anyone is interested. And in there, uh, an academic called John Jerem looked at how closely different commonly used markers actually track to long term family income using data from the Millennium Cohort Study. And he found that some of the ones that are quite commonly used, things like polar, actually are really not very closely correlated to long run family income and shouldn't be used to to try to determine individuals on that basis. Polar is a little bit of a complicated one because it's measuring something a bit different. The measure itself is looking at how many people in a local area normally go to HE, which is a kind of disadvantage in and of itself. But sometimes it is kind of used as though it is a marker of social economic disadvantage and as though it relates to income and it doesn't. So our argument is that instead, if you're looking at that, you should be using ideally individual level markers, things like free school meals. And we're calling on the government to make that data actually verified from schools available to universities so they can better make those decisions and target them to the young people that need them. But certainly at the moment, we recommend that polar shouldn't be used for decisions on individual students. And if area based measures are used, that either ACORN or IMD should be used. A problem with IMD is that it is, sorry, a problem with ACORN is that it's paid for. 
you have to pay to use it and the methodology isn't open but it does relate really quite well to family income compared to some of the other area-based markers so that's our recommendation to to universities in terms of the practice they should be using then we also think that there's no use to giving out contextualized offers if the students who could get them don't know about them and quite often it can be quite difficult for young people to actually figure out if they've never you know no one in their family's applied to university to start with and they try going on the website and it takes going through pages and pages to get to information about contextual offers it's not very helpful for the student and quite often they won't know and just don't apply because they don't realize that it exists so we think there should be much greater transparency for applicants to make sure that they know these offers exist and that they can apply to them. So then one of the other areas that we've looked at a lot is student finance, specifically in relation to the pandemic. We've looked at the impact that that's been having on the financial situation for students. And there are quite a lot of students who seem to be struggling because of the pandemic. And especially because a lot of the things that they would normally work in, like hospitality, retail, are some of the sectors that have been the hardest hit by the pandemic and that work just hasn't been there. So we think hardship funds should be increased during the pandemic to make sure that those students do have access to the funding that they need to be able to continue. In terms of looking more widely, aside from the pandemic and the immediate impacts, for a long time we've called for maintenance grants to be reintroduced. One of the big problems at the moment is that the poorest students end up taking on the most debt when they go to university because they need the most funding, they're getting you know, little or no help from their parents. But that then means they end up having to make larger repayments over their lives from the fact that they've borrowed this larger amount of money. So our preference is that there should be the reintroduction of maintenance grants to try to rebalance that a bit. We also think that there is some evidence that debt can deter poorer students and that they tend to have kind of negative attitudes to debt, even though they do understand the tuition fee system as it stands. So our suggestion is to have means tested tuition fees. So again, to make sure that the poorest aren't ending up with the most debt and to help with some of that debt hesitancy for poorer groups. We also think there needs to be better tailored and more flexible support for mature and part time study in the UK. And also that postgraduate funding should be reformed to increase access. So we have a report out by some academics at the University of York in about a month looking at postgraduate access in the UK and how the loans that were introduced a few years ago have impacted on access. I'll give a really quick set of slight spoilers, which is they have helped access, but there are still problems, which is maybe what you could have guessed. Um, so we're going to have some recommendations there about what should then happen going forward. So watch this space or well, the Sutton Trust website basically for that later on. And then finally, on these policy points, I thought I'd talk a bit about access to the workplace. So one of the big issues for young people from poorer backgrounds trying to get into the profession specifically and something that we've looked at for a long time are unpaid internships. So in the UK, most unpaid internships actually are likely illegal under existing national minimum wage law. But employers don't have a very good understanding of that when it comes to interns and neither do the interns themselves. And at the moment, it relies on the interns self-reporting to the government that their internship is illegal, which obviously not very many want to do because they're risking all the connections and networks that they're working unpaid to get. So the system doesn't really work very well and means that these are able to continue. So we have two suggestions on the ways to tackle this. One is that there needs to be better enforcement of existing national minimum wage laws. So employers obviously aren't doing this themselves. They don't understand it properly. We asked them a series of different scenarios that we had checked with an employment lawyer and asked whether or not they were legal. And several of the ones that are illegal and where they should have been paying national minimum wage law, most employers thought that they were in fact legal. So things like paying a stipend that doesn't actually equate to the national minimum wage for an internship. So they are paying them some amount of money but they're not paying them the national minimum wage. And it wasn't only for expenses. It was just a general amount of money. That isn't legal, but lots of employers thought that it was. The same around issues like having set hours and set work that you can't refuse. Lots of employers thought that that was fine, but it isn't. 
so and I would say there is an exemption to that for people who are doing it as part of a university course so you can do a year where you go in somewhere and do a placement and this doesn't apply but out of that context they thought it was legal and it wasn't so two of the suggestions we have is making sure they are properly enforced and also that there's an explicit ban over four weeks in length of unpaid internships at all so that would serve as a kind of check that the longest unpaid placements couldn't keep happening the difficulty is that any law around this and how you try to define an internship can accidentally cover things that actually you want to have happen like kind of work shadowing and things where there is some kind of you know calls to say well maybe that's fine for doing it for a week lots of times kids do that in school and it's quite useful what we don't want is these kind of long placements where people are completely priced out of doing them so that's why we think there should be a kind of solid ban after four weeks to make it extremely clear for the intern and the employer that that isn't acceptable and people shouldn't be working for, for that amount of time without getting any kind of pay. We also think that employers should be looking at the socioeconomic background and diversity of their workforce. So we released a report a few months ago that is a guide for employers to kind of explain to them how can you improve social mobility in your workplace and in that there is one simple question that we've developed together with the social mobility commission which is a part of government to give just an easy to use question that you any employer can use to measure the social economic background of their workforce so it's based on the occupation of someone's parent when they were a teenager and we include with it benchmarks for the whole population who are of working age so you can compare as an employer, OK, this is the proportion of my workforce who are from a professional background or a working class background. And this is what the whole UK workforce looks like. Do I look really different? Do I have far more people from professional backgrounds? That's then a, a kind of warning sign to try to do something about that and look at that. So we've got lots of explainers in there of exactly how to measure it, tips to try to help to get high response rates to the questions and everything so if you're interested definitely have a look at that we also recommend that employers should make use of contextual recruitment so this is similar to contextual admissions to university that employers should look at what someone has previously done in the context of their background so both looking at exam results taking into account that getting three a's from an inner city comprehensive school is quite different from getting three a's from eton but also looking at things like internships and whether or not, you know, many people who are from quite privileged backgrounds will have had access to unpaid and unadvertised internships through informal networks and for employers, especially at entry level, to really ask themselves, does this, this experience actually show something about this person? How would they have gotten it? And for people who don't have experiences like that, could they show skills through other means? Perhaps they've done caring responsibilities or they've done part-time work that isn't immediately applicable to the role but they might have learned lots of similar skills and really making sure you're pulling that out of candidates and again we've got some information on how to do that in the guidance. We also think that all routes into the workplace should be fairly and openly advertised and people shouldn't be giving them out through informal networks. So then just to say a bit about our research so the way our research works is it's a combination of research reports that we ourselves at the Trust write and ones that we commission from external academics. So in terms of opportunities for potentially doing those pieces of research, we actually don't have a system where we let people come and give us commissions for work or request that we could fund some work. It's much more based on us as a team if we think that there's an issue that we want to cover we will go out and find academics and look at the ones we think would be the best from their previous publications to do that piece of work for us. So what I would recommend is I've got my email address at the end of this presentation. If you have any research that you think we as the trust would be interested in, please do email it through to us and you can send it through to me and I will pass it around the wider team and just make sure that your research is accessible and easy, easy to find online, because if we are looking at, say, we want to have some research into employability things. We'll look fast if we think we can do it internally, but we'll do as part of that process who's currently working on this. Is there anyone who 
would be better placed or already has the expertise to do this work that we could then commission to do that piece of work for us. So just make sure that we're aware of the work that you as academics are doing and make sure it's available, kind of easily visible for us to see online. And if you're then doing work in a space that we're then interested in commissioning on, we'll then approach you to ask, would you be able to do this piece of work for us? I'm happy to answer any questions around that. So I've just shown a kind of combination of a few different research reports that we've done here. We do a combination of these short little briefs that are only a few pages long. So things like measuring disadvantage that we just put out on these different measures of how you can look at social economic background. That's designed to be quite short, easy to read and accessible for practitioners. Whereas this one room at the top, looking at access and success at leading universities around the world, that was done by an external academic and was quite a meaty piece of work. So we have it in this different kind of longer form of report. We also do some that don't quite fit into that kind of mould as well. So this one on the left is our kind of employer guidance for social mobility in the workplace. So we've designed it to be quite accessible to employers. And so it goes through quite clearly to people. They don't need a huge underlying level of kind of expertise and knowledge to, to look at it. And hopefully it should be quite accessible. And then this one on the right is the one I talked about looking at the proportion of people who come from private schools and top jobs. And that, again, we did it in combination with another organisation. So the branding looks quite different and it's designed to be quite visually accessible to reach a, a kind of wider audience. So we do a big combination of different kinds of reports, depending on the kind of audience and our aims with it. And some of them we aim to specifically get to policymakers. Some of them we try to get to practitioners, so people like yourselves working in universities where we want to change their practice. Some of them we just want to a really general audience. So depending on which of those that report is for will then depend on what the report is like and how we advise the academics to write it. So then I just thought I'd say a quick bit about Sutton Trust programmes. So we support young people from less advantaged backgrounds to access leading universities and careers. In partnership with those universities and employers, we run lots of different programmes to give students kind of practical advice to hopefully leave them feeling really inspired and give them more confidence about their future. Because we know that young people from poorer backgrounds tend to have less family experience of higher education or access to the professions, tend not to understand some of the informal bits about it, how to get information, and can sometimes just feel a bit unfamiliar in those environments. So we try to give them help and support to meet people in universities, meet other people like themselves from poorer backgrounds who are also applying for the first time and maybe feel a bit unsure and give them kind of help and support around networking and things for access to the professions. So our kind of main flagship programme are our summer schools. So we run them at lots of different universities across the UK. They happen every summer. This last summer, for the first time since they started, they obviously didn't happen in person. And we have launched something called Sutton Trust Online, which is an online platform for students that aims to give all students across our, our programmes. And we're also looking at giving access to students who meet the criteria for our programmes, but there isn't space for them, to this online kind of world of information, advice and support where they can link up to one another and also see access to kind of lots of different articles and bits of advice that they might find useful. We also have a programme where we take a group of young people each year. Again, last year we couldn't do this. And I think this year it's also not happening in person, but normally we would take them to the United States and give them a tour of a few different universities and help them to kind of apply and apply for financial support and things. And we also do pathways programmes to the professions where we give them kind of more targeted support around a specific area that they want to enter into where they also get work experience to kind of help from employers that way. And just finally, we've also recently launched an apprenticeship summer school to try to help students who want to apply to degree apprenticeships to give them help and support on how to access that route. So before I go on to talking about this report, the University of Life, does anyone want to ask any questions about the trust more widely, our research work, our policy focuses or the programmes? I'm going to take that as no. Do pop in if you want to ask a question at any point, though. 
OK, great. So now to talk about this report, the University of Life. So this report focuses on something that we call essential life skills. Now, these are called loads of different things by different people. Sometimes they get called soft skills. Sometimes they get called employability skills. There's no kind of set agreed upon definition of them and kind of naming um, norms or anything. So we've called them essential life skills, but you will see them being referred to as lots of different things. And the way we define them from looking at the research evidence on it is skills like communication, resilience, motivation, confidence and leadership. So all of those things outside of the kind of key academic skills, but that can actually be extremely helpful to young people, both in their academic work and really importantly for employability. So traditionally, there has been a big focus on the academic side of university, but it's becoming clear that a degree alone is not enough for young people. And we know that even if you have two young people go to the same university and get the same degree classification, the one of them from the higher social economic background will be more likely to gain a top job than an equally qualified person from a lower social economic background. So that's a really big problem. And we don't understand enough all of the issues around that and what is contributing to that difference, which was part of what we wanted to try to get at in this report. And we know there's good reason to think that life skills do have an impact on this. So in a previous report before this work, we asked employers if they think that life skills are at least as or more important than academic qualifications. And 94 percent said that they thought that they were. And 52% think that university graduates don't have the skills needed to succeed in the workplace. So it seems like there's a big gap in terms of what employers want from what they're getting from universities. And we also know from recent research by a group called Skills Builder, who are doing some really interesting work on this, I definitely recommend you having a look at. They found that there's evidence actually of a wage premium for young people who self-report having these skills. So they asked them, do you think you developed X, Y, Z skill at university? And then they also separately looked at their wages as a, a graduate and found that those people were earning higher skills when they said they felt they had those skills. So it's obviously a limit with self-reporting and it would be better to have someone at some point of independently assess those skills and then looked at their earnings. But unfortunately, we haven't had that research yet. <laughs> so in terms of this report, I'll just talk very briefly about the methodology for it. So we did a literature review of the existing evidence on what was known about essential life skills and their development in university. And the first part of the report just gives a bit of a summary of that. And it helped us to identify which activities we looked at in this report. We then did two sets of polling. So using YouGov, we polled recent graduates. So that's defined as those 21 to 25 years old, UK based, who have a degree or higher. And that ended up being about just over 2000 people and we had the university type for most of them. So that's whether or not they went to a Russell group, a pre-1992 or a post-1992. And I've not included that in this presentation, but there are breakdowns by that in the main report if you're interested. We also, so the main reason we wanted to ask graduates is because they had recently been at university, so hopefully would remember what they did when they were there but they also had experience in the workplace to be able to reflect back on, OK, did I learn these things at university and did it help me in the world of work? So that's why we picked that age group. But we wanted to check that they were remembering properly and that their experience was reflective of today's students. So we also did, using YouthSight, another polling company, um, some polling of some current undergraduate students. So that was a smaller sample because that's what they have access to in their omnibus. Um, and for them, we had the university type for all of them, but we didn't have the social grade for quite all of them. So it's a smaller group when we're looking at those breakdowns. So we double checked whenever we were doing the data on the recent graduates, how applicable it was to today's graduates. And in the main report, we've included commentary about that. What I'm going to show you here is largely based on the recent graduate polling. But if you're interested and want to see if there were any differences, almost always it was the same across. But where there were differences, we've reflected that in the main report. We've looked at social economic background using social grade categories from the National Readership Survey. So we've really loosely referred to ABC1 here as middle class. Because our reports are aiming to go to quite a broad audience, we try to use that kind of simplified language to make it clearer for people. 
and C2D we've classified as working class. And then we also did an online search and contacted universities to try to establish what current provision in universities look like. And I pulled out a few examples of what we thought seemed like quite good practice um, to have a chat through the case studies in the report. So first off, looking at the activities that young people do at university. So from the literature review, we found that there was some evidence that these activities could help with life skills. So we looked at paid work, student societies organised within a university or student union, work experience, placements or jobs that were related to someone's course or career interests, so not just paid work that they had to do for paid work, and study abroad. Now, as you can see, paid work was the most common thing that students said that they did alongside their course. It was also quite common for people to do student societies. Then just under half were doing work experience placements and a quite small proportion actually did study abroad at some point in their degree. And again, this is why it was important we asked recent grads, because for things like study abroad, if you asked a second year, maybe they've just not done it yet. So we wanted to reflect what people did over the whole course of their university life. So we then did breakdowns for this by social economic background of those students. And it was quite interesting, actually, where we found differences and not. So there were actually no differences in the proportion who were doing paid work. It was really similar across social economic groups, although we did delve a bit more deeply into that, which I'll talk about in a second. But we found that working class students were less likely to do student societies within their university or student union. And they're also less likely to do work experience placements or study abroad, although the numbers doing that were relatively small, as mentioned. So it does look like there is this kind of gap in experience and the kind of activities that people are, are doing when they're at university, which is potentially a problem that the universities could try to tackle. So we asked students as well when they were working, because it's quite different in terms of your university experience if you work in the summer holiday versus if you're working during normal term time, if you're working in the final year of your degree and if you're working during exam periods. So we asked the students who were working when they worked, or sorry, the recent graduates when they were students when they had worked. So they were equally likely to say they worked in summer, summer holidays, and that was the most common um, time for students to say that they worked. But students from working class backgrounds, CTDE, were more likely to do it during term time, were more likely to do it in their final year, and more likely to do it during exam periods. So it seemed like they were less able to kind of move the work around what else they needed to do when they were at university, which could obviously have impacts on how well they're able to do when they're there if they can't kind of um, move that around as would work for them. We also asked the students who worked why they worked. So were they doing it to cover their basic living costs or were they doing it to just have extra kind of spending money? And again, there was a difference, even if it's relatively small. So students from poorer backgrounds were a bit more likely to say that they were working to cover their basic living costs and they were less likely to say they did it to have extra money to spend on themselves outside of that. So again, it seems like they're having a bit less choice in being able to decide to work or not, whereas sometimes those better off students are doing it just to have kind of extra money as opposed to trying to do it because they because they need to. So we then asked those graduates, OK, for each of those things, if you did them, how well do you think that activity developed your life skills? And we asked for each of these skills that I mentioned previously. Now, as you can see, it differs quite a lot between different activities. And I think that's the main takeaway from this is that doing a broad range of different activities when at university can best help a student to kind of get that more rounded um, set of skills from their experience. So for instance, if you take leadership, only 24% of the graduates thought their university course had helped and taught them this skill, whereas 43% of those who were involved in student societies felt that it had developed that skill. So if students have an opportunity to do a really broad range of different activities, it's much more likely that they're going to develop these kinds of skills. And there were some that were an, another good example of that is while 66% of students who did study abroad felt it developed their resilience, that was much less likely in student societies. Only 23% said that. So again, having that kind of broad range of experiences seems to be quite important for developing these skills. 
We also looked at students living at home or not as one of the breakdowns in the report, which are included throughout. But I thought I'd just highlight this example in terms of participation. So students who were living at home were much less likely to do student societies, which is potentially a, a big problem in terms of accessibility of those activities and how much people are able to do them when they're when they're kind of based away. And it will be really interesting after the pandemic to see how much some of the online participation for those activities will stay because that potentially could help to allow those students who actually live at home, perhaps further away from campus to be able to access and kind of be involved in those activities. We also looked at paid work and students living at home were more likely to do that than those living away from home, which is really interesting because presumably that is that they're staying at home both to save money and they need money more generally. But it was interesting, so I maybe thought it might have been the other way around because they were already saving money by living at home, but they do actually seem to need that additional money. So what were the barriers to participating in these different activities for the students who didn't do it? And how did they differ by social economic background? So looking first at work experience. So some of the most common reasons that young people didn't do that work experience was because their course or university didn't offer an option to do so, or there weren't any kind of relevant placements available, or they didn't have an interest in doing it, they just didn't want to. But students from poorer backgrounds were more likely to say that it was because their course or university didn't offer it, or there weren't relevant opportunities for them available, or that they couldn't afford to because they had to take on better paid employment or they couldn't afford the cost of commuting, or they couldn't do it because of existing work commitments. So again, we're seeing an inequality there and in what the kind of barriers are, which should help us as well to look at ways to address them and how they could be opened up for different groups of students. I will say in terms of the university or course not offering it, obviously this is just based on what the student knows, oh sorry, the graduate like knew. So maybe their university did offer it, but they just didn't know about it or never accessed it. Then looking at societies, again, there were some differences by social economic background in the barriers people cited. So the most common one was just people not being interested in what there was on offer. Some say they could, couldn't do it because of paid work or jobs that they had, or they didn't have time because of the workload of their course. Not having any societies or activities that interested them was more common for working class students, which is a, again a question of what is available for students? Are they meeting all students' needs? Are they being communicated effectively to students or can they take part in it for the first time if maybe they didn't know about it at school? Are they getting the information? And also they were more likely to say they didn't have time because of paid work or jobs that they had. So that was more of a barrier. Poorer students also were more likely to say that they couldn't afford the cost of taking part. So things like the cost of social events or equipment that they needed and also that other people in the society made them feel unwelcome. So that was quite low proportions of students saying that, but it is quite a concern that there could be an issue there about what's it like for students in those societies? Are there proper reporting mechanisms if people do things or say things to them? Like what is the way to make sure that those societies are really kind of open to everybody? Then we also asked the same kind of question for students who'd not studied abroad. Now, given a lot of students don't study abroad, this is a much bigger group of students being asked, well, why didn't you? And a lot of them just weren't interested in it, just didn't want to do it at all. But again, looking at social economic backgrounds, poorer students were more likely to say that they couldn't afford to because of the costs of relocating, living costs are expensive, or that they'd never travelled abroad really at all or much previously, and that that was for them a barrier. We also then asked the students who did paid work what the impact of that was on doing other activities and again break that down by social economic background. So students from poorer backgrounds were again more likely to cite these things as kind of an impact on other activities. So they were more likely to say that it impacted their ability to meet people and socialise, to take part in work experience or student societies or to study independently outside of their core learning. So we then asked um, these graduates, to what extent do you feel university has given you employability skills, both to get hired and to perform well? So the good news is that most graduates did think that they were getting those skills, but there was quite a large proportion still who said that 
they didn't. But the students who are from poorer backgrounds were more likely to say that actually it didn't give them those skills. So again, there's a difference in what kind of experience they're getting from university and how they feel that's impacting on their employability by their socioeconomic background. And they also were asked whether support in the development of specific employability skills was sufficient. So things like social skills, finding the right jobs and opportunities, networking, preparing job applications and job interviews. And again, there were some differences. So students from poorer backgrounds were less likely, less likely to say that it developed their social skills enough and that they had the right help with finding the right jobs and opportunities. And um, very slightly less with networking, but not a big difference less for preparing job applications and less for job interviews. So again, there's a difference in that experience. So then the last bit I thought I'd just run through is what some existing provision in universities is and some examples of things that are quite good practice. So to find information for this, we looked across university websites and then we emailed the universities included to ask them to confirm it to us because sometimes the information just wasn't available online or we were worried we might miss things. And we got confirmations back from about half of them. So we did look at quite a limited sample of universities here, basically to try to match up with the kind of universities our programmes are with. If we'd had more time, we would have wanted to look more widely. So we looked at the Russell Group as well as five other highly ranked universities. I say that in inverted commas because university league tables are quite arbitrary. And we're actually doing a piece of work in the next year, hopefully, that will look at university league tables in more detail and actually look at how well universities contribute to social mobility. So how well are they getting kids from poorer backgrounds and getting them to high earnings later on in life, rather than just taking kids already from better off backgrounds and then, oh, well, surprising, they've got good jobs because they already had good opportunities. How much of that is the university? So we do appreciate that highly ranked universities is a bit of a weird, not useful term. Um, but, you know, we also have to exist in the world as it is. So that's the group of universities we looked at here. But just to explain that we do kind of know that that's not necessarily actually that useful. We looked at careers advice and support, financial support for work experience, study abroad, financial support and extracurricular, for extracurricular activities. If they had course modules within their universities to help develop life skills, if they offered something called service learning, where people go out and do kind of volunteering work and then reflect on it. And if they had kind of course credits and awards for extracurricular activities. So because it wasn't a completely accurate way to look at this, I'm not going to say 60% of universities offered X, Y, Z. In the report, we've got some discussion about what we found in terms of whether it was quite common for universities or very rare. But what I thought I'd focus on here was some of the examples we found through this process for case studies that we thought were quite useful. So one example is from the University of Lancaster, and they have specific employability support for their widening participation students. So one of these is a scheme called Grow Your Futures, and it's an opt-in scheme designed to help students who are either in receipt of the Lancaster bursary so that's students who meet govern government criteria for financial support or who have household incomes of less than £30,000 or who are the first in their family to attend university, are care leavers or were young carers, are BAME, started their undergraduate degree after the age of 21 or who identified as disabled. So lots of the kind of typical widening participation groups of students that they thought needed additional help. Through this programme, they gave them early access to career opportunities through the university and they gave them explicit training from the university on things that they could do, including looking at things like interviews. They also ran specific open days for them and they gave them access to specific internship opportunities. As well as that, they had kind of a sub scheme within this that students could do where they could do visits to graduate employers, both in London and in Manchester. And whichever city they went to, they would do a networking event there with other Lancaster graduates who were already living and working in the city to kind of give them, I guess, the experience of, yes, people like you who've done this thing you've done have now gone on and done roles like these. You could do it as well. And so they could ask them questions about what it's like to live and to work in in either city. 
And for those trips, the university covered all the travel costs and the accommodation. So cost wouldn't hopefully be a barrier for the students to take part. Another example is at the London School of Economics, and it's actually not run by the university, but by their student union, which is an access fund that they have for activities within the student union, a participation fund. So it's to help students who are struggling to pay for a club, society or event. So students who are asked, like, why can't you afford to take part? They have to give a kind of outline of their current and expected income and why the activity will have a positive impact on their university experience. So the idea is that this will help to remove kind of financial barriers to participation. Now, I think this is a great scheme to have. I think having that application process could put some students off and be quite difficult for them and potentially a bit stigmatising. So I think having, say, funds available for WP students on kind of terms more similar to the Lancaster scheme might be a better way to do that. But the general idea of having funds for those students is, I think, a really helpful one. And then finally, the University of Liverpool looking at ways they help students to study abroad. So they have specific funding available for students to help them to do that. So this is back in Erasmus times rather than the world that we currently live in where we're not in that anymore. But they gave uh, additional financial support to students who couldn't get the Erasmus Plus grant. So it was means tested and they gave more to students from poorer backgrounds. So if they were on a household income of 25,000 and met the university's WP criteria, they could get £1,000 and then that gradually got lower depending on the household income that they were from. They also had a series of other bursaries through other schemes that could help to cover like flights and meals and accommodation and activities and things. So there were kind of lots of options for funding for students to be able to apply to. So just as a final bit, we had some recommendations for this report of, OK, given all of this, what needs to happen? What should be different? So one of our first recommendations is that universities should help students from lower social economic backgrounds to access paid internships and work experience to help those without the kind of networks to be able to find them. Universities should look at embedding opportunities to develop employability and life skills within students courses so that they can access it within their course without having to access student societies and things because we know students from poor backgrounds are less likely to access them, maybe they need to work or have caring responsibilities. So we thought that could help to make them more accessible. That universities and student unions should look at and tackle barriers that students from lower social economic backgrounds face in taking part in extracurricular activities. So things like having specific bursaries for it. And that especially universities and student unions where disadvantaged students are significantly underrepresented, but all of them in general should really be looking at ways to create environments which respect and promote diversity. So things like not having students put off of student societies because of the people there, looking at ways to tackle that within the institution and making sure that if there are complaints of that nature, that it's taken really seriously. Then we also had some recommendations for government. So one of them is on the Turing programme, and that's the new replacement for Erasmus for study abroad. And our recommendation there was that they need to make sure it really transforms opportunities for disadvantaged students to study abroad because we know they're less likely to do so. Thus far, I'm not overly optimistic from the stuff I've seen from the Turing programme. I think it's having a lot of problems getting off the ground so far, and it does seem like there is going to be a bit more support financially for the poorest students, which is really promising, but I'm still concerned it won't necessarily be enough for some of the places they want them to go to. One of the other issues is we found that students from poorer backgrounds were more likely to study abroad in Europe rather than going further afield. So one of our concerns is that there might be fewer of those opportunities through cheering if they're trying to focus it a lot on things like the US. Now, we don't know exactly the reasons for that, and it might have been that Erasmus giving them that extra financial support is why they went to Europe before. So if you give them financial support to go to the US, actually some other barriers are less because they don't have, say, a language barrier and students from poor backgrounds are less likely to have done languages. So there is still some more we need to understand about it. But yeah, I guess we just need to see how that scheme plays out and keep looking at it in the long term to make sure 
it is working for disadvantaged students. And as said previously, we think maintenance grants should be restored and that whether through loans or grants, the government needs to review whether there's enough maintenance available, given so many students are working, so many are working to meet their basic living costs, and that's more likely to impact poorer students and stop them doing other activities. So we think there needs to be a proper review of, do they have enough money actually to live on? Um, I'm going to skip this next bit actually and give people a chance to ask questions and if there aren't loads of questions I can do this bit but I've overrun a bit it's taken a bit longer than I thought so I'll go to questions now.